Did you have any idea they were working on this kind of stuff? A while back I made a video on the whole Half-Life Tower, a mod made by a Half-Life mapping community that's been going steady for over 20 years now. This is a unique mod that is essentially a clever twist on a mapping competition. Developers were given a pre-built map, or floor, with a limited amount of space, an entrance, and an exit, and the rest was left pretty much up to their imagination. This resulted in a collection of maps ranging from action-oriented shootouts, to stealth, to puzzle solving, to this. I'll put into a single, seamless playing experience. That way you don't have to download a map pack and load them up one by one or something. I enjoyed playing it, and was happy to see a few years later, the forum members got back together and made a sequel, with even more polish and over twice the maps. I tried it out, got some gameplay footage, some ambient shots, forgot to write a script, and now it's been almost two years since then. Oops. A lot of videos that aren't Half-Life mods later, I decided to don the hazard suit once more and give this mod the day in the spotlight it deserves. This is the whole Half-Life Tower 2. Before I begin, here's some quick stats. TWHL Tower 2 was released in November of 2020 after almost a year of development. While Irby led the development team of the first tower, the next game was administered by Strider, who made the chairman map previously. Throughout its development time, this second tower was given over twice as many levels as the last, from 13 floors to either 25 or 26. More on that later. The maps were created mostly by new talent, but a few developers from the first game had maps to contribute as well. The formula remains the same, with the limited size maps, the entrance and exit, and the force field that resets your character at the end of the level, but this time a new feature has been added, collectibles. Each floor has a hidden Half-Life CD for you to find, whether it's on a desk blending into the environment or in a strange corner of the map. If you collect enough of them, you get something cool. With that in mind, I will be going over every floor in the game, so I recommend you try it out first before watching the rest of this video if you want to be surprised. I enjoyed playing this mod. It's free on ModDB and is maybe a two-hour jaunt for a first playthrough. I don't want this video to necessarily replace the experience of trying it for the first time, so I put a disclaimer here. With that out of the way, let's get climbing. Or falling, actually. Where the first game ends with a climactic shootout on the roof, the next one begins up top and has you work your way down. Oh, thank God, someone finally heard my... Oh, it's you. <laughs> Hello. You're greeted by What's-His-Face from the first game, let's call him Andy. Andy is once again trapped in the tower as all hell breaks loose, and it's up to you to disable the security lockdown on the ground floor so the two of you can get out of this mess. This is the game's warm welcome, made by Strider along with Penguin Boy and Unk. Where the beginning of the first tower was pretty standard Half-Life gameplay with progressively stronger weapons and enemies in a constricted space, this level actually puts you in a position of all thinking and no shooting. Areas are blocked off by tripwires that set off turrets, and since you don't get any ranged weaponry to take them down, setting them off means your only solution is to run or hide. My first impression is that the map looks really nice. The nighttime atmosphere is perfect, the layout feels fluid with how you have to crawl around the infrastructure, and I enjoy the mix of indoor and outdoor spots as well. To open the locked security doors, you have to destroy them using some unstable steam pipes somewhere else on the roof, a touch that feels better than an ordinary keycard or button. There's also some extra dialogue if you try to pester Andy into letting you in. What, are you mad? Have you actually lost your pissing mind? I'm not letting anyone in here. Overall, it's a great, polished start to the mod, and on the topic of that polish, everything looks a lot better in these stairways. While the first mod has a dark, stuffy stairwell that fits in well with the original Half-Life, Tower 2 has a full view of the city below, the interior design is a lot brighter and more detailed, and there's even a little bit of foliage. I like it. 
After enough time spent admiring a stairway, I can move on to the first real floor of the game, Pest Control by Jamaican Dave. Warning. Alien life forms detected. Security lockout activated. This map requires us to exterminate all alien life forms within this office building to open a security door, quickly giving us our first taste of combat. One thing I like about this map is that it doesn't overstuff the player with weapons. You get the standard crowbar, shotgun, and just enough ammo to comfortably defend yourself. Placement of enemies also feels natural. Head crabs are visible and not jammed into an air duct. Zombies have a decent amount of room where you can take them out with any weapon. And forts are surrounded with cover to use as well. The map feels nice and looks nice too. The layout feels realistic and might be less blocky than stuff you'd see in the original Half-Life. Area clear. Security lockout deactivated. I like it. It's a real good introduction, but there's a lot more floors to go. Next up is Phantom Lab by Dolmo, and I don't see an entrance to the map, so I'll just go ahead and... Uh, Phantom Lab, just up ahead, is... Well, now, it would not be right to allow you to proceed without first demonstrating your... limitless potential. I usually don't have any scathing criticism to write for these videos. I think even putting your work out there in the first place is an achievement, but I have to get something off my chest. This is the third map of the game, and there's already a spooky interrupting sequence of events that goes into 80 seconds of G-Man telling us about interrupting our descent for something or other. It's all time spent waiting for him to finish so you can actually play. This map contains three separate G-Man cutscenes too. I did a playthrough of this map, and I can say 40% of it is spent standing still or going in circles waiting for something to happen in particular. These are supposed to be bite-sized mini-projects with a steady pace, so this style of mapping seems counter to the whole philosophy of the game. Especially when we've only played two other maps. Greetings. I needed to get that out of the way so I can talk about all the stuff the map does well, because it's not a bad map by any means, it's really good actually. The use of deep colors is nice, the tight quarters laboratory environment is unique, and it's all an impressive use of the space provided. I love the feeling of breaking the glass and going through this window into the offices above, it's really well put together. You get a sense of exploration and actually have to fight some tougher enemies like the alien grunt this time. The feeling of exploring an area with one wave of enemies and then coming back to it with a second wave is interesting, especially now that the marines are involved. The only thing that sets the Phantom Lab back is the Phantom part. The strange introduction to the map, along with cutscenes both before and after, are grating, but the map is quality work. If I were in charge, I would personally cut the G-Man element entirely except for visual cameos, speed up the grunts appearing here, take out the spooky intro, and replace it with, maybe, a hidden button that reveals the lab behind a brick facade or something. Dolmo, the map's creator, published a developer commentary video where he highlights some features of the map, like the challenge of fitting a two-story map into a single floor, and also the use of bright primary colors in individual rooms, so that the player doesn't get disoriented. Both features I thought were interesting. He also brought up how the map was created assuming it was going to be placed somewhere in the middle of the mod, which makes perfect sense. He defended the length of G-Man's speeches, saying, to paraphrase, that at the time he wanted the map to be more ambitious than simply stepping in, shooting up, and stepping out, and he actually had a larger script planned that he had to cut down. I appreciate the map's ambition, and I can genuinely say it's worth the wait. The Tomb, by Ogdred and Windows, is the biggest deviation we've seen from the Tower formula so far. The first game was full of offices and laboratories, but this looks like a hell of a place to work to me. The sudden shift in location is humorously explained in an email here, stating Mike told his co-worker Bob his office needed some redecorating, and Bob responded by turning the entire floor into an Egyptian tomb. Naturally, Mike's first thought is to head to Human Resources about it.
This map is actually more of a first-person platformer, and has you jumping over pits of lava, ducking and weaving around spikes, and solving puzzles with a spiky ceiling that closes in on you. The gameplay works well. The map has a good atmosphere, but I would advise having a quick save button handy in case your jump is timed wrong or the floor literally gives way underneath you. The map feels really big for the space it's restricted to, looks nice, and ends with a bang too. Cargo Specimen 798 by Cywar Veteran is probably the map that leaves you the most helpless out of any of them. We notice a slight change of scenery here with some messy storage containers, hazardous waste, and a not-so-happy scientist. Did you submit your status report to the administrator today? The only way out is through here, and it's not going to be pretty. What is he doing in there? Get him out of there! Shut down the equipment and someone get him out! This guy right here is the Kingpin, an unused enemy left in the files of Half-Life. Here he is being kept in captivity, and is apparently not happy about it, given he can completely melt you in a few seconds if you don't find cover immediately. This map is unique in that it's a tight, circular corridor with a death machine in the middle that you have to outrun or find cover from. You've run one way to grab a pistol, shoot down a computer thing to open a door, run the other way until the thing puts up a psychic wall, then make it all the way to the control center on the other side of the map so you can hit the return to sender button. I like this map. It's a unique kind of action where your only defense is making it to the end, and since the Kingpin has a deadly aim and can shoot through windows, every bit of health you have feels necessary. If I had any criticism for the map, I would say the purpose of the pistol wasn't clear on my first playthrough, but it's a creative way of sectioning off the other area. Glad that's the end of that. Next up is The Food Court by Truck Stop Santa Claus. Hello there. This map is a spacious plaza with three distinct food chains to choose from. There are no aliens to splatter or puzzles to solve, so technically you can just eat your pizza and head out. Or you can stay, talk to people, throw yourself in the deep fryer, or look for secrets. Actually, it's a pretty precise jump, but if you manage to step on this fraction of a sign and then strafe up here, you get... Nothing. Actually, I just wanted to show off. I like the movie posters and such scattered around the map. It was all modern by the time the mod came out, but incidentally, it's a bit of a time capsule. It'll be fun coming back here in 10 years. Having a map like this after that last one is a nice way to ease tensions, and even if it's pretty silly, this is the only map I've seen where you can get something to eat. Good morning, Mr. Freeman. Looks like you're running late. If you've already heard of this mod before, I can bet dollars to donuts it was because of this map right here. Half Pint by Mr. Floyd is a miniaturized version of every chapter of the original Half-Life put together. Hey, Mr. Freeman. We have the entrance to Black Mesa, the anti-mass spectrometer, Sector B, two parts of the office complex, Hey, what the hell are you doing down here? The start and end of We Got Hostiles, the entirety of Blast Pit put into some monitors, the best part of Power Up, and my favorite, On a Rail. After getting beaten up just like an apprehension, we get put in the garbage crusher, past the conveyor belt, into the ethics questioning lab, 
out to the garage from surface tension, through the radio spot and forget about Freeman, right into the weapons storage of the Lambda Complex and the Portal Chamber. Just like another remake of Half-Life for the longest time, this mod also goes without Zen for time and scope constraints. Instead, treating us to this nice outro room that gives an overview of the game we just got a digest version of. This map is honestly perfect. It's well sculpted, it's humorous, it's fun, and even with its novelty value, it still has combat and gameplay. With a limited map size, it impresses me just how many effects don't require an actual huge space, like the sound effects and screen shaking used in some places. There has never been a more perfect way to squeeze Half-Life into six minutes of play, especially knowing it had to be done in a limited map space, too. It would work just as well as its own map, but I'm really glad to have this be a part of the tower. Memories by Zick Shadow is a complete tonal shift from the map we just played, but I'm glad they're right next to each other. Where Half Pint was a tongue-in-cheek recreation of the Gordon Freeman experience, Memories uses the same close-quarters exploration in a much more unnerving way. In this map, you explore a series of dark, short stories, crystallized moments in time, each one from a different person. You get glimpses into creative burnout, warfare, conspiracies, alien invasions, Oh, I think this is a Sonic reference, actually. And finally, letting you loose in an abandoned supermarket. While the gameplay is exploratory, each map gives you some weaponry, some ammo, an HEV battery, loose things that prepare you for a battle that isn't happening. At the end, you exit through that first memory back into the real world, allowing you to move forward and appreciate the interesting atmosphere and ambiance. That... Let me just say I hope you picked up those weapons, because this staircase becomes a battleground pretty quick. While I fight this guy off, I'll tell you a bit of context for this map. In 2016, the creator Zick Shadow published a blog post on ModDB about going through creative burnout, showcasing multiple unreleased projects along the way. If we look at the screenshots, we can see some familiar scenes, including the idea of exploring several smaller horror scenes and collecting items. All things considered, these pieces of maps really lend themselves to the micro-mod format of the tower. Maybe this G-Man scientist zombie abomination is a representation of imposter syndrome? Could shooting him down represent overcoming creative burnout? Whatever he's meant to be, he's history now. Generally, I like this map. I like the layout, I like the twist, and I like the history. I especially like seeing Zick made progress on a new mod of his own after this game released. It makes me glad these maps were made more than just the creator's own memories. Orange Corp is a map made by Dr. Orange, who made the Lab Complex map in the previous game. Rather than being greeted by a custom voice-acted scientist, these offices are administered by Alice, an AI built to guide visitors around the Orange Corporation International Headquarters. The first part of this map is a spacious, dark office space with some humorous information signs, cool flooring, and an overall good map vibe. It would almost be cozy if it wasn't for the spots of blood littered about. I don't care how many times it's done, I love these gags on the monitors where they have the map itself being worked on in Hammer. There's even the whole Half-Life website and the first tower mod pulled up on the other computers. Those are just evergreen to me. Once you have the crowbar, you can make your way to the CEO's office and... It looks pretty grim. In the security room, Alice explains she wasn't the culprit here, and the slaughter that went on in here was actually, get this alien ghosts. Of course, not believing any of this malarkey, we open up the printing room and oh god, they're real. Fighting these guys off with a provided shotgun and pistol is simple enough, but there's a couple more weapons around the map if you know where to look.
Once you re-kill the ghosts, Alice finally opens the exit door, since obviously you're just gonna wreck more havoc the longer you stay there. Even though I liked the variety of Orange's original map, this one feels a lot more modern, and makes good use of the space provided. The hologram effect on the aliens is cool too. Good stuff. Over here. This is my hiding spot, and I'm not moving until the situation is drastically improved. Now go away, and don't tell anyone I'm here. I'm not so sure I want to go to the surface. Tilla Office by Rolling Barrel takes place in a secret laboratory being stormed by the government. This map's combat focuses exclusively on the human grunt enemies, which can be fine for some, but a bit of a slog for others. I personally was fine with the enemy placement in this map. I like the little puzzle here with using the turret against these couple grunts, but also including the fact that the turret can target you if you're not careful. I like the drop you get on this guy here, which leads into the main part of the map. Dispatching more marines, then pulling out the gluon gun and destroying all these glass energy things that all shatter and explode all satisfying like. You destroy these two, then take care of the sentries that pop up, then destroy the final core to the teleporter. Yeah, that was messy, but at least we made it out of there alive. The destructive environment of the map was my favorite part, but it was generally solid and had some fun ideas. The training course by Spike Hunter is unique in a few different ways. First of all, the map gives us a variety of weapons, ammo, and energy right off the bat, meaning we're expected to ration these out through a long period of the map rather than find them piece by piece. Secondly, the environment is maze-like and has no verticality to it, giving it an almost Wolfenstein-like simplicity. Finally, the enemies in the map are all not human grunts, but actually the robot grunts from the German version of Half-Life. Or just the multiplayer model if you're not a total Half-Life factoid nerd. Like I am. The map consists mostly of tight corridors that later open up to larger areas with cover to crouch behind. The grunts work most often in groups, and are capable of flushing you out with grenades and working together. Keeping your pace calm and your shotgun close is recommended, and remember that your grenades can be thrown over the walls of the map. Once you take down all the robots in your immediate area, you can press this button to unlock the security gate, but it also blows up a bunch of walls throughout the map housing more robots. Using the cover to your advantage is greatly beneficial, and with the right aim, you'll be out of there in no time. From the simple visual design to the two-wave enemy placement, I really like the combat focus of this floor, and I think it makes up for its lack of visual flair. Then again, if the map isn't your favorite, you can always slightly damage yourself with a grenade. Then use a grenade jump to boost yourself over the wall and into the next map. But that would just be rude. Next up we have Smash and Grab, a map by Strider that goes for a stealth espionage angle. Our only weapon is the crossbow, and our enemies are not only the security guards spread around the area, but also cameras that will set off a deadly gas after seeing you four times. Your goal is to grab this priceless object, but along the way you'll have to smash five power junctions to make it there. 
Every bit of the map's gameplay is smooth, and definitely improves upon Strider's previous sneaking concepts seen in the first tower. The crossbow is a perfect weapon for dealing silent headshots, a detail that makes it feel even more like a covert operation. The graphics for the security cameras, specifically, are also impressive. The map functions perfectly, looks nice, and has the important element of fun. Jamaican Dave's Savior has a heavy combat focus like pest control, but still has some nice aesthetic details as well. No! I don't want to die! I like this cutscene of sorts that plays out as soon as you enter, with the scientist cowering behind a security door and grunts slowly closing in on him. We make our way to the other room and, uniquely, are greeted with a turret without any weapons to counter it. We get not a pistol, but a crowbar and some grenades in a back room, which we have to use wisely to proceed. I really like this design choice because it takes advantage of the player's inventory resetting between maps, and emphasizes working with what you're given. Those grenades come in handy once you start having to fight the grunts, because the tight quarters rooms makes it easy to flush people out. In the end, no matter how good your aim, the scientist has already been killed. And by the time you get the keycard to the next floor, there's a whole other wave of grunts making their way to finish the job. Making your way backwards through the map is a good gameplay element, especially with the amount of cover you're given. The map is enjoyable, and among other things, I like how much these windows add to the map. Just adding these windows means we get cutscenes at the start and halfway point of the map, and we get the preview the environment will be blasting through to reach the keycard. It's good communication. Coming up on another map by Strider, we have Zen Garden, the best possible name for any map ever. According to a mapper's review of the game, this map was made to fill in an empty space on the roster after another developer dropped out. The result is a pretty relaxing, ambient map with a very modern layout, nice custom textures, nice lighting, and even a sense of humor. You can technically leave right after finding the security unlock button, but collecting the CD takes a little extra creativity. It's a nice spot to rest after a few combat maps in a row, since this one has no enemies. Unless you decide to test just how domesticated these headcrabs are. This map marks about the halfway point of the whole mod, give or take, so it makes for a good interlude. Dr. Orange returns with the next floor, Apartments. This is a map that has you doing some light exploration of an apartment building. Trying to watch some TV until you have to go and fix a blown fuse. A fairly simple task, and then return to... Hey, who's that? It's a nice little ambient walk around with soft lighting and a non-puzzle, but once you go to bed, things really go to hell, and I mean it. Gone are the simple hallways, replaced with fleshy corridors and spiky masses blocking your way. Gameplay is still pretty simple, just requiring placing another fuse and finding a way over a fence, but it's an interesting walk and has some real atmosphere to it. Not much of a turnabout is a map by Penguin Boy, owner of the whole Half-Life, and it's definitely not like anything else in the mod so far. This is a murder mystery map where you gradually explore each room of an apartment building, making notes on the victim, the culprit, the weapon, and the motive. Each room has a set of clues inside of it, and are highly interactable, with every drawer and cupboard having a little animation that may or may not reveal something. Some rooms are red herrings, some information might not be useful for the tasks at hand, but there's a definite sense of progression as you get to look at the murder scene itself and start working around that. 
I really like this map. The mechanics behind it are solid, with interactable objects having a little twinkle over them. There's some cool technical effects like the full screen displays, and every room has a clue counter, so you know you've seen everything you can see in that area. It's probably the most lighthearted murder scene I've been to, with a combination of references and silly world building and environments, without taking away from the gameplay. You get three shots to get the details right, with your reward being a Half-Life CD. If you're stumped or the gameplay isn't your cup of tea, you can press this button here to move on and leave the mystery for the next curious soul climbing up or down the tower. Irby, who led the creation of the whole first mod and made a couple maps of his own, returns to the tower with Headley and Crab, solicitors. After some quick reading, I now know a solicitor is a British term for a legal professional handling civil cases, kind of like a lawyer. I suppose this is where the whole brain-sucking parasite thing may come from, but who knows? As far as the content of the map, you're first left exploring the office grounds a bit without seeing a soul, but as soon as you get the crowbar, be ready to use it. This map exclusively works with zombies and head crabs, and since you only have close quarters combat to work with, you have to be careful. Once you make it to the security room, you open up the exit to the next floor. But the door malfunctions, meaning you have to take an ominously bloody shortcut with... Hey, eat this, you bastard! That guy barricaded in there. You make your way out using your newly obtained firearm, and that's that. It's relatively simple in design, but the execution is nice, and I enjoy the limited scope of weapons, too. Cywar Veteran, who made the most tense combat map so far, shifts gears with this next map. And the whole stairwell shifts gears as well. Welcome to Darkwoods Penitentiary. This is a dark, moody, abandoned asylum type map that goes for a horror vibe all the way, and it's okay, if not ordinary. You get some disembodied voice action in a prison cell. Over here. Some obstructions to take care of with the crowbar, and a bit of extra exploration involving some levers. It feels like some bog standard Half Life horror mod fare, but there's something just aloof I can't put my finger on. After all the puzzles are solved, you make your way to the exit and... Over here. Did you submit your status report to the administrator today? Why, just look at those peculiar markings. A common problem with games, sometimes with playtesting, is that people never think to look up. Here's me getting destroyed by a soldier in TF2 who was perched up in a spot on the ceiling of 2 Fort I never bothered to check. Too Much Video Games, who made the recreational floor in Tower 1, remedies that issue with their map Flippant. It's a standard shootout map. You enter a seemingly empty room, pick up a weapon, the door locks behind you, and some grunts ambush you from the ceiling? Yes, indeed. Enemies in this map can use both the floor and the ceiling to their advantage, meaning you have to keep both dimensions of the map in mind with your limited weaponry. The tension this causes is elevated by the introduction of the female assassins, who can be quite lethal quite easily. The map layout isn't especially noteworthy, but the tech behind it is amusing. Sometimes the hitboxes on the grunts don't work so well, which makes them just absorb your bullets, but shooting them works more times than it doesn't. It's generally a pretty good map, with a gimmick that got a rise out of me. Up next is Ogdred's Von Braun, and this exterior doesn't give a single clue about what this map will look like. Let's see. Warning. 
There is a class one intrusion alert in the cryo recovery suite. There is a class one intrusion alert in the cryo recovery suite. What we're looking at here is a total recreation of the look of System Shock 2, the immersive sim classic released almost a year after Half-Life. The music, sounds, colors, and objects are all based on the med side deck, the first area you explore in the game. But the layout and puzzles are all original to the tower. Half-Life doesn't have a native way of handling keypads like System Shock does, so Ogdred made a custom UI setup for that that works well. The map has a high attention to detail and implements multiple elements from the original Von Braun, including turrets, battery-powered doors, and an audible appearance of a hybrid here. Insufficient access. The harmony is disturbed. This map requires the player to do some puzzle solving in order to make it through a grate in the other side of the map, guarded by a sentry gun, obscured by a locked door, and too high for the player to access without some help. All three of these goals are met throughout your exploration of the deck, in a way that feels pretty seamless to me. Even though System Shock 2 is still on my to play list, I really appreciated the look and feel of this map. Ogdred published a few short YouTube videos before the tower released, showing this floor started out a personal project to recreate the med side deck in Half-Life, which then turned into a planned deathmatch map before being sculpted into the mini-mod experience we see today. At the end of the level, we say bye to Xerxes and head on out to the next floor. Honestly perfect. Cupid's Q by Lucas323 lifts us from the chilly experience on the Von Braun and drops us back into familiar Half-Life fan map territory. I would say this map is rustic, a good word might be? It's not bad, you get a few weapons and work your way up the chain of smaller to larger enemies, the gameplay element is fine, it just all has a certain roughness to it that's almost nostalgic. The location of the map doesn't make much sense, it's like a security checkpoint holding a kind of office house setup that opens up to a secret lab that has a big ventilation system connecting it all together. My god, what are you doing? The one NPC there is a scientist standing in a pool of water to get blasted by a firing squad of Vortigaunts. It's eccentric, but not careless. For how haphazard the map may feel, I got a kick out of there being functioning light switches in these rooms here. I especially like this little hint here about the hidden CD. On my first playthrough, seeing this little spot in the grate made me go back and look everywhere for a secret lever or something. It's strange, but some would call it neat, too. Cywar Veteran completes their trio of maps with Trial by Fire, a map I definitely consider the best of their two non-combat ventures. The map takes place in a small two-bedroom apartment where something unspeakably horrific has occurred, and it's up to us to get the full story and take care of whatever caused this. This is an exploratory map where the player learns the story around the apartment through a collection of scattered notes by the tenant. Based on his writings, the tenant got a call from his brother John, who needed a place to stay for a while. While he was there, he was increasingly antisocial and distressed, which worried his brother. John began physically atrophying and transforming over time, until his brother had to lock him in the spare room, and couldn't will himself to kill something that may have originally been his brother. As the guest of this house, we don't have sentimentality holding us back. Getting some gas and a lighter, we treat the unseen demon doppelganger to a one-way trip back home the only way we know how. The map sets a disturbing mood well, and I like the notes element as a bit of non-linear storytelling. 
With how many horror maps there are in this mod, I wonder if that's just an archetype of gold source mapping, or if the devs were shooting for an October release date instead of November. Either way, it's a welcome addition to the game. Coming up on the last few maps of this mod is Hard Inferno by Zuni, an office map with a heavy combat focus. A fellow scientist. The first thing you'll notice in the map is a barrage of head crabs up in the ceiling. I get why they're here. They keep tensions high while exploring a small, dark space, and while they're a bit of a pain, if you chip at them with a few shots of the pistol at a time, you should be able to safely explore. The second thing you'll notice is the instability of the ceiling, with it being easy to fall out of a weak piece of it or shoot pieces of it off. This leads into the second part of the office, a military takeover that you have to take down single-handedly to proceed. My interest in this map lies in the multiple choices a player has to get through it. One type of player may flush out the grunts with grenades and then hop in to take care of any remaining enemies. Another may find a secret spot in the ceiling that leads to a ton of ammo and SMG grenades to rain on them instead. Either way, once you reach that security button, the heat really ramps up. Things start exploding, a second fleet of grunts appear on the other side of the map, and an Apache helicopter flies in to greet you. A sane person would run for the exit and be safe from there, but if you really want to show off, you can try to hurl a grenade into the helicopter too. You don't get any bonuses for that, but man does it feel cool. That's what this map seems to be about, feeling powerful after surmounting a couple dozen marines and making it out alive. I like how everything in the environments are destructible, from the lights to the bookshelves. <laughs> and the little Christmas tree here is a mod to a certain action flick that also involves death and hardness. Once you get it figured out, this map is a fun one. Probably the most ambitious map of the mod is put right here at floor 1. This is Repishage by Unk, a Half-Life mapper who's been working on maps and collaborations since 2002 or so. This is another unique, gameplay-centric map that feels like a mod in itself. Before I get to the map, you can visibly see out the window that you're approaching the ground floor. A really, really nice detail in my opinion. Anyways, your mission here is to go ahead and take everything that isn't nailed to the wall, and even then. You play as an art thief, making your way through the largest exhibit in the entire tower, but not only are sections blocked off by impassable lasers, but the paintings themselves are covered with a high-tech security seal. Your SOBs, or Security Obfuscation and Bypass Units, are built to help you get past both of these, but you have a limited number of them, and once you pick them back up, the security lasers come back, meaning managing your SOBs is a vital part of gameplay. Another part of gameplay is finding hidden parts of the gallery, since the security boxes protecting the art are placed a lot less nonchalantly than the ones for the doors. Once you've taken what you can, and after some crawling around, you've reached what appears to be the exit door, and it seems like you're home free with quite the haul. Unfortunately, this map has other plans for you. Getting past this wall requires more than just an SOB, but a secret room helps you make better sense of an exit plan. Crawling up these ducts, you can find a means of turning off the security locks, at the cost of releasing one of the worst foes we've witnessed thus far. Warning, unidentified bio-weapon detected. Giant snarks. 
Well, actually, they're not that bad, but healing in this map isn't super common, and these guys appear multiple waves across the whole floor. Once you get a moment's peace, you build a GTFO device that is powered by the exact same lasers that guard some of the paintings, rerouted through the power of your upgraded MF SOBs. At this point, we've made our escape and can leave now, or we can go back with our final SOB, collect any paintings we missed, and start looking for secret areas in the meantime. Because there honestly are a couple well-placed Easter eggs on this map that you have to find if you want 100%. If you want 0%, on the other hand, you can simply make your way through the gallery without taking any paintings, and the map gives you a pat on the head for it. An element of this map I haven't talked about yet is the art itself. Repishage features a wide array of historic art from over the centuries, but it also showcases the talent of newer artists within the Half-Life scene as well, including The Insider by watercolorist Joanna Barnum, La Toreadora by Hannah Carter, and Silent Antagonist by Marina Mensi, along with this lovable render of G-Man by Niker107. These works were actually commissioned by Unk with the express purpose of being used in this map, a move I find very exceptional and thoughtful, and shows just how much love went into this project right here. The architecture of the gallery is smooth and dynamic. It all looks great and plays without any real bugs or snags, and I love the idea itself. This is the perfect place to have the tower finish up. Or start if you're going from the bottom up. Reaching the ground floor, we have All Foyered Up, a map by Strider, Penguin Boy, and Unk. But I'm most curious on which one of these three came up with the name. Good job, everybody. This is a map with some light combat, some light sightseeing, some light climbing around. It feels like it was built as a second introductory map, which is fun. It's got that Strider polish we've been seeing in their maps so far, and I really like the Deus Ex nod here. And also, the first ever Half-Life kitchenette. You make your way to the media room here, perfectly sneak attack this grunt, perfectly sneak attack this grunt, and make your way to the other side of this door with some vent crawling. And there it is, the security lockdown switch. You've made it! You flip the switch, pay a visit to the armory for no reason whatsoever, make your way to the exit, and... It looks like your stay has been extended. What started out as a pretty lax map now has you fighting grunts in every corner of a small plaza. And if you survive that, a tank busts through the front doors to make sure you don't make it out alive. Luckily, the Gluon gun makes short work of anything that gets in its line of fire. Your reward for your effort is a greeting from Andy as the two of you can finally leave the whole Half-Life Tower. Well, I, uh, I guess you didn't do a, a half bad job. I, I mean, I, I don't want to almost consider myself impressed. Anyway, let's, uh, let's get out of here, shall we? You know the, the big guy is going to want an explanation for all of this. Are you good with paperwork? Not only can he leave the whole Half-Life Tower, but you are free from the whole Half-Life Tower, too. Yeah. Now for some people, that's where the mod ends. But if you collect more than half the CDs, you get a bonus map that I'm not telling you about until you unlock it yourself. Oh, you're back. Good. Now I can tell you all about Cenodrome XL, a bonus basement level made by Unk as a final showdown for the mod. You're back. Now, this level has a bit of history since it was actually made in 2018 as a sort of lost DLC for the first whole Half-Life Tower. 
where the original map had you pit enemies against other enemies, this update has you fighting in the Cenodrome yourself against a slew of enemies. You find out who you're fighting, pick your weapons, and the round starts. It has a very fast and loose arena playstyle that you don't really get from any of the other tower floors. It's actually quite refreshing. I especially liked getting to fight against these powered up Barneys here. Round three. Super cool. Round six is actually a gauntlet of wave after wave after wave of new enemies, including the abominations from memories, army grunts, alien grunts, you name it. It's honestly a lot of fun, especially since you have the gluon gun at your disposal at that point. Make it to the end, and you're treated to the grand final boss of TWHLT2, Baron Von Ictus. Yes, yes, and yes. And with that, your trip through the tower is complete. Man, good job. The whole Half-Life Tower 2 is an order of magnitude more polished than the last game, and I definitely had a lot more to say about the maps. I would say some parts of the first tower are rough around the edges by comparison, actually. I find the second game has more pleasing visuals and a more interesting range of maps, that range including both changes in scenery and in gameplay. With that in mind, Tower 1 still laid solid groundwork for the next mod and showed that a large cooperative campaign like that was not only possible, but fun too. I recommend giving this one a try first if you were picking between the two, because both are important but the second tower feels a lot more like a game. More than one game, actually. The amount of maps is almost intimidating, but not one of them feels like filler. Even if a couple of them bring less to the table than others, each map is unique, and they show a combination of skill and personality. Give it a shot if you want, check out other works by the mappers, and have some fun. Status. Report. Denied.